Okay, hazardous materials, multi-casualty incident, and incident management is uh, what we're going to be talking about now. And uh, as an EMT, you are going to respond to scenes where there are hazardous materials present. And the last thing you want to happen is to become contaminated. Uh, so we'll talk about the whole hazmat material response. You'll also respond to scenes where you're going to have multiple casualties uh, and as a result may have to do things like triage, um, call in additional resources, those sort of things. And then when the scope of the um, situation that you're responding to becomes um, a major event, then you'll need to be part of what's known as the uh, incident command system where you'll set up incident management and we'll discuss that as well. So a hazardous material is any substance or material in a form which poses an unreasonable risk to your health, your safety, or to property when transported in commerce. Now that's the United States Department of Transportation's definition of a hazardous material uh, because they're of course dealing with um, chemicals and materials that are being transported across our highways. but. Uh, perhaps a better definition of hazardous material is any substance or material which poses an unreasonable risk to your health, safety, or property, period. Now, uh, OSHA requires uh, training. Uh, there is a first responder awareness training, which is uh, what the NFPA says EMS uh, providers need to have as a minimum, the first responder awareness training. And there are no minimum hours for that. Uh, most often that's something that's done in an hour and a half, two hours uh, at that level. And then there's the first responder operations training, which can be up to eight hours. Uh, and this is based solely on or mostly on uh, fire-based uh, courses, which have a little different uh, flair or a little different approach to hazardous materials uh, response than a uh, EMS provider on an ambulance. And then uh, you've got the hazardous materials uh, technician course, which can be up to 24 hours. Uh, so a, a course that occurs over uh, two or three days. Uh, and then the hazardous materials specialist uh, course, which is a, an additional uh, two or three days. Um, quite readily in your area, you will have awareness training, you'll have operations training, but often you may have to go to a, a specific place uh, that offers the technician or specialist training, especially if you're part of a uh, hazmat team uh, with a uh, fire department. Um, one of your responsibilities, of course, is first recognizing that you're in a hazmat incident. Uh, and, you know, sometimes that can be pretty obvious. You arrive on scene and there's tanker cars tipped over and there's chemicals leaking out and there's visible gas clouds. You know, those sort of things you certainly can uh, tell as you arrive uh, that uh, you're going to be dealing with a, a potentially hazardous uh, incident. Um, you know, in, in its most simplistic form, every motor vehicle collision you're at is a hazardous incident just because of the uh, gasoline or diesel fuel that you may uh, have to deal with. Um, when a person is in a hazardous uh, environment, uh, they often will become contaminated. Not always, but often. So when people leave the hot zone or the red zone or ground zero, whatever you'd like to call it, when people leave that area, uh, they're considered contaminated until proven otherwise. So they often have to go into a warm or a yellow zone uh, where they can be decontaminated uh, and then move out into a green or a cold zone where they can be placed in an ambulance and treated for their uh, illnesses or injuries. Um, so you do have to establish those zones uh, when you do arrive. Uh, and I don't know that that's necessarily the responsibility of the EMT unless you're part of a hazmat team. Um, you know, typically it's your uh, fire service that uh, has the overall management of an incident. And um, 
they will identify uh, the hot zone, and that's where the contamination is, the warm zone, uh, that's where you'll do your decon, and then the green zone, that's where uh, it's safe for everybody to, to hang out. Now, the reason that firefighters typically are um, the ones establishing these zones is that uh, some of these zones are environments that are not um, amenable to life. In other words, there's no oxygen in those environments. And, uh, you know, unless you're wearing an SCBA, uh, you couldn't survive in that environment for long. Uh, and that's why um, typically it's the fire service or a hazmat team that uh, establishes these zones. Uh, the cold zone is the green zone, and that's that's where equipment and emergency rescuers are staged. So, you know, you certainly can control the zone that you're in. Uh, when you roll up to a scene and you see this uh, potential hazardous environment, you have to make uh, an attempt uh, to assess and establish what the substance is. And we can do that through a variety of methods, whether we look at the placard on the vehicle. Uh, there's usually a four-digit number that goes along with the placard. And using your emergency response guidebook, an app on your smartphone, uh, you're able to identify what that substance is. Um, often you can use binoculars. We'll use, or what's safe to use, is called the rule of thumb. Uh, if your thumb, if you hold your thumb up in front of you and it obscures or blocks the scene, then you're far enough away from the scene. Um, then you use your binoculars to identify signs, labels, placards. Uh, and then in your emergency response guidebook, uh, you can look up that uh, information to determine what the substance is. Now, <coughs> if the person driving the vehicle isn't contaminated and certainly has access to things like the bill of lading, uh, shipping manifests, uh, or even invoices to give you an idea of what they're carrying. Um, once you determine what it is that is, uh, what the substance is, then you need to look at the safety data sheet. The safety data sheet um, used to be called the material safety data sheet, or MSDS, and now it's just called the safety data sheet. Um, the safety data sheet gives you, oh, um, the name of the chemical, uh, perhaps the address and phone number of the company who makes the chemical, uh, information about its, how toxic it is. Um, and if you're not sure, you know, if you're not sure or don't have access to a safety data sheet, uh, but are certain the chemical that you're dealing with, you can look that up in your emergency response emergency response guidebook, or you can call uh, Chemtrek, which is the Chemical Transportation Emergency Center, and they would be able to assist you as well. Um, these are other places where you can get expert advice, Chemtel. Uh, you may have a um, list in your ambulance of state authorities or state agencies. Well, one of the things that uh, one of the agencies that does need to be um, contacted during a hazardous spill is the Department of Natural Resources. Um, your poison control center is always going to be a great uh, uh, expert or give you great expert advice concerning how a particular chemical uh, may be treated. Um, and be sure to leave thorough information about the scene, um, a callback number, um, the container, the conditions, the location, the quantity, the number of injuries, uh, and, and exposures. Now, exposure, by virtue of you knowing this is a hazardous uh, scene, you're exposed. Uh, whether or not you become contaminated depends on what you do next. So here is the uh, latest and the greatest emergency response guidebook, the uh, 2012. It's published every four years. So the 2016 should be out soon. Uh, and this is kind of the Reader's Digest condensed version of safety data sheets. Um, there are uh, yellow pages, blue pages, and orange pages. If you know the four-digit number 
of the chemical, you can look in the yellow pages, and that will give you a three-digit guide number that you'll find in the orange pages. And the orange pages are the safety data sheets. If all you know is the name of the chemical, you'll look in the blue pages. And um, uh, once you find the name of the chemical in the blue pages, it will give you a three-digit guide number that you'll look up in the orange pages to find the safety data sheet. Um, you're also going to need to establish a treatment area, and I would believe that this would probably be EMS's primary responsibility um, not to go into the hot zone because you're not trained unless you're uh, a um, uh, trained at that particular level and wearing SCBA. Uh, typically, we don't allow EMS providers in the warm zone unless they're trained at the operations level. Uh, that, because at operations level, you can help do decon. Um, so if you're not, uh, you know, at those levels of training, then if the only level you have is the awareness level, then you need to stay back in the cold zone uh, and you can begin setting up your treatment area. It should be protected from weather, should be large enough to accommodate uh, multiple rescue crews because as other services arrive, you're going to have to stage them somewhere. Uh, it should be easily accessible by other responding units. It should be free of exhaust fumes and uh, should allow a rapid re-entry into the emergency operation. Um, decontamination, is, as I've already mentioned, occurs in the warm zone. We're going to do our treatment in the cold zone. And uh, field decontamination patients are not completely clean. It's called a, a fast break decon. Um, you still, if you're participating in the decontamination process, uh, you do have to wear proper personal protective equipment uh, or proper personal protective clothing uh, to prevent secondary contamination of you. That may be chemical protective coveralls, uh, boots, gloves, uh, may even include a uh, air respirator, uh, like a PAPR, a positive air purified respirator, um, like a, a Breathe Easy or an Airmate. Uh, those are uh, just uh, blower motors that force air through filters, and you breathe the air that's around you, but it's been filtered clean. Uh, you want to protect the vehicles from contamination. That may that may require you to tape, uh, you know, break out some plastic and tape the whole inside of the vehicle so that. Uh, if a contaminated patient, and of course we would never recommend a contaminated patient be put in an ambulance, but if uh, some contamination gets in the ambulance, at least your cupboards and the ceilings and uh, sidewalls and those sort of things, seats, are protected by the plastic. Um, there are four types of uh, patients that you're going to have to care for. Uh, the uninjured and non-contaminated patient, uh, the injured and not contaminated patient, and then the uninjured contaminated and the injured contaminated. Now, with the injured contaminated, you may have to provide or somebody may have to provide some initial care before the patient actually gets decontaminated. It may include handing them an oxygen mask, uh, maybe handing them an auto injector like an EpiPen, something like that, if, if that is uh, within your scope. Um, you want to take precautions appropriate to the substance as listed in your emergency response guidebook uh, because in that safety data sheet in the emergency response guidebook uh, is listed what you need to wear, uh, how you need to do decon on the patient, and what sort of first aid measures you can provide uh, for that patient. patient. Typically, when dealing with patients who've been exposed to hazardous chemicals, uh, your treatment is going to be supportive. Uh, in other words, uh, you're going to manage the airway, you're going to manage the breathing, you're going to manage the uh, circulation, uh, just like you've been taught. But you need to wait until the patient is decontaminated in order to do that. Um, if treatment calls for irrigation with water, remember that water only dilutes most substances. It doesn't neutralize them. It may dilute them to the point where they're harmless, uh, but they still have the substance on them. Uh, after treating the patient uh, at the hospital or back at base, make sure that you take a shower, 
uh, remove and isolate your clothing, which eliminates 80% of the contaminant, and then uh, take a shower uh, yourself. Uh, depending on the chemical, your uh, clothing uh, may need to be disposed. Remember that leather boots and shoes, uh, if they get wet uh, with the chemical uh, or with the water that's running off the body that you're decontaminating, um, leather will absorb those chemicals and lock them in. So your leather boots or shoes would need to be thrown away as well. Uh, the phases of a decontamination include gross decontamination, and that's where the chemical or the majority of the contaminant is removed, and that's by just having the patient remove their clothing. Uh, you want to isolate their clothing, um, and the reason you want to isolate it is if the chemical is a liquid like chlorine or ammonia, uh, it's going to be giving off a very noxious odor. And if we just set them in a pile off to the side in the back of the truck or, uh, you know, wherever we're doing the decon, uh, then the uh, fumes could uh, affect everybody around. So remove and isolate the clothing is going to get rid of 80% of the contaminant and then um, uh, shower, 20 minutes in the shower. Uh, use uh, soap. Um, we typically use dish soap. And the reason that we use dish soap is that it is uh, it, it works well on chemicals that are very persistent, uh, very oily. Um, you know, if you just use uh, other soaps, they're not as good and don't break oils down as well as dish soap does. Uh, dish soap is also uh, contains no phosphorus, which may react with some chemicals. Uh, so just plain old ivory, Dove, Dawn, um, no antibiotic, no scents, no aloe, not just plain old dish soap. Uh, you want to have them uh, get wet. Uh, you want to apply the soap, uh, rinse it off, uh, apply the soap, rinse it off again. Um, these are certainly different things that occur during decontamination. There's emulsification. Uh, that's breaking down those very persistent chemicals. Uh, there may be a chemical reaction during the decon. Uh, there are certain chemicals that if you apply water to them, uh, they will uh, heat up and uh, can actually cause burns, um, particularly very strong bases. Um, there's also disinfection, dilution by adding all the water, uh, absorption and adsorption, uh, these are things that occur uh, depending on the temperature of the water or the rate at which they absorb uh, depend certainly on the temperature of the water. The warmer the water is, if the pores open up, they could uh, absorb the uh, chemical more. Uh, and then removal of the um, water is uh, and disposal, removal of the chemical, it gets washed off, and then disposal of the water is uh, something that is one of the reasons we call the Department of Natural Resources, because it's that agency that's going to tell us whether or not we can just let the water run into the storm sewer uh, or whether we have to collect it all. Uh, most often, um, you'll put enough water on something that uh, you'll dilute it to the point where it's non, where it's not harmful, and it can just run down uh, into the storm sewer. Now, if you're decontaminating 50 or 100 people, um, you know, that's something that may have to occur quickly. And as a result, you know, you get the fire department setting up their hose uh, with a nice fog pattern uh, and they can, you know, decon 20, 25 people at a time in a, a channel between two uh, uh, trucks that are parked there. Uh, and nobody's going to collect that water. That water is going to go where that water goes. Um, the objectives of decontamination are to determine the appropriate level of personal protective equipment that you need. Sometimes your uniform is just fine. Other times you need chemical protective coveralls. Other times you need chemical protective coveralls and a positive air purified respirator, particularly with things like chlorine and, and ammonia. Um, any more than that, we're starting to look at firefighters with turnout gear and SCBAs, you know, those sort of things. You need to set up, operate a decon line and prioritize the decontamination patients according to a triage system. Uh, you know, you may have 50 people that you need to, to uh, decon, and uh, we, we talk about things like throughput. Uh, we have six showers in our organization, 
uh, and we could do two people an hour in each shower. So we could do 12 people an hour. Well, if I've got 25 people, uh, there's going to be 12 or you know 13 people waiting over an hour to take a shower, and uh, you know that's that can be really problematic. So um, you have to uh, prioritize uh, the sickest get uh, decon first. Um, perform triage while in personal protective equipment so that you don't become contaminated. Uh, personal protective equipment, uh, particularly if you're wearing a uh, positive air purified respirator or even an SCBA, it's very difficult to communicate while in that personal protective equipment. Uh, it's very difficult to provide uh, care, um, uh, you know, even ventilating a person with a bag valve mask is extremely difficult while suited up in that equipment. Uh, some basic lists of equipment that you're going to need for decon. You're going to need buckets, brushes, uh, decontamination solution, which is dish soap, uh, decontamination tubs, uh, showers, um, a dedicated water supply, uh, tarps or plastic sheeting. Uh, again, containment vessel is iffy depending on the situation. Uh, and if you are or if you have to collect the water, um, then you may have to pump the water from your containment vessel into buckets uh, as your pool or your um, containment vessel fills up. Uh, an A-frame ladder uh, is something that may work as well. Appropriate level PPE for responders. Uh, and then um, once you've completed the decontamination, then each of the providers wearing personal protective equipment need to have their personal protective equipment rinsed and soaped off and rinsed uh, so that you can wash any potential decon off their equipment. Um, so scrub the suit with a brush starting at the head, working down, rinse again, starting at the head, working down, and then help the responder remove their personal protective equipment. Uh, again, containing the runoff is... is uh, going to be something that the DNR will tell you whether you have to do that or not. Um, do know that in these suits, people are not going to be able to work for hours on end uh, just because they don't breathe well, uh, especially if you're wearing SCBA uh, or a, a positive air purified respirator. Uh, so, you know, if they can get 45 minutes or an hour out of them, that, that's doing pretty good. Um, so when wearing uh, personal protective equipment, your first consideration is your safety. Uh, you want to use a public address system to direct ambulatory patients to the decon line. So over the radio, maybe telling those patients at self-transport to uh, where they're supposed to go for decon. Again, have them remove and isolate their clothing, remove their valuables, put them in a Ziploc bag with their name on them uh, off to the side. Um, they're saying double bag the clothing, at least a single bag tied tight uh, so that you isolate any fumes. Uh, they say res receive a two to five minute water rinse starting at the head um, and then soap and then water and then soap and then water and then uh, send them on their way. Um, it's important that we try to gender separate these patients if at all possible because uh, you'll have men and women, children, uh, elderly, uh, patients with special needs, depending on the given situation. And so if we can gender separate them uh, so that uh, as they remove and isolate their clothing, they're not in plain view of everybody. So here is a, uh, uh, that's our discussion on hazmat. Now we're going to talk about multi-casualty incidents. And of course, a multi-casualty incident uh, can be a small event or a big event, depending on your resources. Uh, when you have an incident that uh, exceeds the resources that you readily have, it now becomes a multi-casualty incident. So if I've got six ambulances and I've got, you know, five or six injured patients, that isn't a multi-casualty incident. But if I have one ambulance and two staff and I have those five or six patients, that now becomes a multi-casualty incident. Um, know your local disaster plan, and pretty much uh, every service uh, should at some point in time 
drill their disaster plan with the county emergency manager, with the local hospital in the county, if you have a hospital in your county. Um, the drills should be uh, well publicized so that people can um, discuss beforehand how they would respond, maybe even do some tabletops beforehand uh, so that they know how they would respond. Uh, the drills should be realistic um, and uh, the plan should be rehearsed and that's why we do them annually. Uh, the National Incident Management System or NIMS came about as a result of the wildfires in California in the 1970s. Uh, it was brought to front and center uh, following 9-11 with uh, Presidential Directive, Homeland Security Presidential Directive number five, uh, which made mandatory all federal and state governments having to adopt the National Incident Management System as a way to manage all incidents. Uh, it's an all hazards approach to managing a incident. Um, the positions in the National Incident Management System uh, can be um, remembered by the acronym CFLOP. Uh, they don't have it in that particular order on this side, but slide, but that's how uh, I memorize the positions or the key positions in the Incident Management System. Uh, you've got command positions which include your incident commander, your liaison officer, your safety officer, your public information officer, and perhaps a medical technical specialist. Then you have your operations section, and your operations section uh, carries out um, the plan. They're the worker bees. They're the ones that do all the life-saving and those sort of things. The logistics uh, section. Uh, logistics provides the operation folks with the resources they need, both uh, physical resources and human resources. So providing them with ambulances, providing them with equipment, providing them with uh, the things that they need, but also providing them with the bodies they need to care for the patients that they're dealing with. Um, then there's the planning section, and the planning section does just that. They write a plan. Uh, they write a plan for demobilization when the incident is all over. They write a plan uh, B, plan C, plan D. Uh, most people have a disaster plan. Uh, it's what they drill when they do their drills with uh, uh, the county and the other agencies, law enforcement, fire. Um, that's plan A. But what if plan A doesn't work? Uh, what if things happen that we didn't think of? Most our disasters are self-limited. In other words, they only last a couple hours, and they're self-defined. Uh, car, car versus um, school bus or something like that. Now, being um, self-limited, self-defined, we often don't get an opportunity to utilize this national incident management system. Uh, but we're talking a major event that may go on for days, weeks, or months. We're going to need to implement this system to manage that operation. So the finance folks, the finance section, they're the ones that keep track of all the expenditures. They're the ones that keeps track of all the volunteer hours, all the paid hours. They're the ones that keep track of, of uh, all the equipment used. Uh, they're the ones that write checks to get things that we need quickly. Uh, and... Those are the positions for incident command. Uh, command positions, operations, logistics, planning, and finance. Now, your incident could be a single incident where your system that you're in manages the entire incident. Or it could be what's called a unified command where geographically the incident may be separated. So um, an example of a unified command might be a major train derailment. Uh, you'll have some people on one side of the train, others on the other side. 
and each side may have their own unified command. Uh, each side may have their own incident command, uh, but those two commanders need to be speaking to each other in a unified method. Uh, or you may have a outbreak of some infectious disease that uh, covers multiple counties. Well, each county will manage their own uh, disease. However, they need to be talking with the other county commanders uh, in surrounding counties so that they, again, unify uh, their approach to managing this, uh, this disaster. So the incident commander is assumed by most to be the senior member of the first service on the scene. Um, you know, that is the genuinely acceptable first person on the scene, highest seniority takes over. Um, but typically the incident commander on a EMS scene is the fire chief. Uh, doesn't mean that you can't have an EMS incident commander if there are going to be multiple EMS services responding, uh, a law enforcement incident commander, if there are multiple uh, law enforcement agencies responding, and a fire service incident commander uh, overseeing the entire scene. The law enforcement and the EMS incident commander need to be unified with the fire department uh, in managing the incident. Um, there will be times either because somebody of higher seniority arrives and takes over your command that you'll have to transfer it or the operational period will be such that you're 12 or 16, 18 hours into this incident like a tornado in Parkersburg that went on for days. Um, at some point, the incident commanders, the operation section chief, the logistics section chief, the planning section chief, those positions need to be replaced. Uh, you need to put new fresh bodies in there. So there is at some time going to be a transfer of command. Um, you know, as an EMS provider, your first responsibility is certainly safety of you and your crew and the patients when you arrive on scene. Uh, and the next is to care for patients. But if you've got 20 or 30 injured patients, when you first get out of that truck, you're going to have to size that scene up. Do I need additional resources? What kind of resources do I need? And then you're going to have to begin triage to determine who of those 25 or 20 some patients is going to be treated first and who's going to be treated last. Um, this requires you to uh, organize uh, your uh, triage process and to delegate responsibility to other EMTs because a uh, staging area needs to be set up where all the ambulances that respond with equipment can stage that equipment. A triage area needs to be set up where patients, once they are triaged, or actually a treatment area, once they're triaged, they can be dragged or carried to uh, the treatment area where they can begin to receive their treatment until they're transferred out. So scene size up, you arrive at the scene, you establish incident command, you do a quick walk through the scene to assess the number of patients, hazards, and degree of entrapment, uh, get as calm and composed as possible, and radio the initial scene report and call for additional resources. On arrival, give a brief report and request the necessary resources. The incident commander is the only person to converse with the comm center, disseminating information to other, others. This eliminates uh, where you have, um, you know, 10 ambulances responding and all 10 of them think they need to talk on the radio, uh, give reports, uh, ask lots of questions. Uh, that just really uh, plugs the frequency up. Uh, people step on each other, nothing's heard, uh, and it's really disastrous. So the incident commander is the only person to converse with the comm center. The incident commander is the only person to request the additional resources to um, communicate with, uh, you know, other responding services, those sort of things. Uh, you do want to have a face-to-face -face conversation with uh, command staff whenever possible. So, you know, your operations section chief, your finance section chief, your planning, your logistics, those positions need to uh, get together and talk on how it's going and do they need 
uh, you know, to modify or change anything that they're doing. And that's typically called uh, uh, an operational period. Uh, these meetings occur uh, somewhere near the end of an operational period. And the incident commander will set that operational period. Uh, you know, they may say, uh, your job is to do this, uh, get back to me in half an hour, 45 minutes, and let me know where you're at. Um, early and aggressive organization in an incident command system is vital. Uh, you have to have a plan to deploy your resources. Uh, think about where you're going to stage all the equipment that's coming in. Um, think big, order big, uh, prevent freelancing. That's other people stepping up and trying to take over. Have some personal tools, such as a tactical worksheet, uh, vests that people wear, um, job action sheets for each individual position. You know, these are things that people will have in the incident command structure. So your EMS branch functions in an incident command system is a mobile command center. Uh, you're going to have perhaps somebody overseeing extrication. Somebody overseeing a staging area, that's where new arriving ambulances will stage and hold until they're called in. A triage area where triage occurs, that's typically where all the patients are initially are. Treatment area is somewhere close to the triage area, that's where patients are taken. That needs to be safe and away from harm's, harm's way. Uh, and that's where treatment begins. The transport area butts up against the treatment area because you're going to load the patients from the treatment area into the ambulances to be transported out. And then rehabilitation, and this is where your providers, if you're working a scene for a length of time, your providers that are working are going to need to get out of their PPE. They're going to need to, you know, if they're wearing turnout gear, carrying SCBA, um, they just need a break if they need something to eat or drink. Uh, need to have their vital signs assessed. Um, you know those sort of things. The goal of triage is to afford the greatest number of uh, people get the greatest chance of survival. So you're trying to do the most you can for the most number of people. Um, typically, the most knowledgeable EMS provider becomes the triage supervisor uh, or the triage officer. Uh, Typically, it's somebody who's well-versed in the start, jump start uh, triage scheme. Uh, priority one is those patients who have life-threatening illnesses or injuries. Priority two are those who have serious but not life-threatening illnesses or injuries. Priority three patients are walking wounded. Those are people that will be up walking around when you get there. And priority four, sometimes called priority zero, uh, are our dead patients or are fatally injured who will die soon. Um, we use START triage here in Iowa. It's a national standard for rapid primary triage. It stands for simple triage and rapid treatment. Um, the foundation of the system is speed, simplicity, and consistency of application. By being quick, by being simple, and being consistent, it takes the guesswork out for you, the EMT, when you have to make decisions on who's going to get treated and who isn't, who's going to live and who's going to die. Uh, those can be really tough decisions to make, particularly if you're dealing with children. Um, the first thing that you're going to do with start triage is start right where you're at. Uh, you're going to holler out anybody that can hear the sign of your voice and can get up and move. You send them over to the green area. Uh, those are all your walking wounded. Those are all your priority three patients. You'll get to them at some point. Uh, in fact, many of the priority three patients, if they aren't injured at all, uh, will want to help. And you certainly can put them to help uh, dragging patients from the scene uh, into the treatment area where they can be treated. Um, <clears throat> then you want to evaluate. You want to go around to the remaining individuals and evaluate their respiration, pulse, and mental status. If they're breathing more than 30, uh, then they're a red and uh, they're a high priority patient. If they're not breathing at all, you open their airway and if they don't start breathing right away, you mark them black and move on. Uh, pulse, you want to check for strong radio pulses. Uh, if the pulse is absent, you mark them black. Uh, if the pulse is um, nice and strong and that sort of thing, uh, you can uh, Mark them red and move on. If then you assess the mental status, you ask them to obey a command. 
if they can obey a command, then they are yellow. If they cannot obey a command, then they are red. So if you're able to walk, you're a priority three. If not, check respirations. And there, the triage officer is only going to provide uh, three treatments. Uh, and I would argue two treatments. Uh, pretty much anymore we teach, start triage, there are only two things you would treat. As the triage officer, you will open the airway and insert an OPA in an unresponsive patient who is breathing. In a patient who has significant hemorrhage, you could apply a tourniquet or a pressure dressing and move on. Uh, other than that, you don't do any sort of uh, treatment. Uh, you want to assess the respirations. Yes, if it's greater than 30, they're a priority one. Yes, they have respirations. It's less than 30. Go ahead and check a pulse. If they don't have a pulse, position their airway, recheck their breathing, not breathing. After repositioning their airway, uh, they're a priority zero or a black. Um, you're assessing the radial, radial pulse in a patient who is unresponsive, not breathing, no pulse, they're a black. If they're breathing, but they don't have a pulse, they're high priority. If they're breathing, their pulse is good, their skin signs are good, their capillary refill is good, move on to checking their mental status. If they're alert, can obey commands, they're a yellow. If they have an altered mental status, they're a red. Um, now re-triage your priority three, your walking wounded patients, uh, by looking at their respiration, pulse, and mental status. Triage does not stop until the last patient is off the scene. Um, patients' uh, situations change uh, depending on the type of injuries they have. Yellows may become reds, reds may become blacks, greens may become yellow. So our color-coded triage tag, our priority one patients are red, our priority two patients are yellow, our priority three patients are green, and our priority four patients or black or blue depending upon the triage scheme. Now secondary triage is performed at the patient collection point or the triage area, treatment area. Patients are separated into treatment groups based on their level. So some people put out cones, flags, different colored tarps uh, so that you know, reds go to the red area, yellow to the yellow, green to the green, and we know we start immediately begin treating the reds and transporting the reds. Um, again, you re, re triage, re triage, re triage until every patient is off the scene. <clears throat> Once assessed, triaged, and treated, and treatment is extremely limited to uh, taking care of the immediate life threats. Uh, the patients are then transported according to their priority. Ambulances are held in a staging area, waiting direction to load patients. Um, once the patient is loaded, then the ambulance takes off and then comes back after dropping the patient off. Um, it's really important that we don't overload the system, that we don't attempt to transport too many patients too quickly. Uh, in other words, uh, you know, we, you'll see people, they will put uh, uh, a red on the cot, a yellow on the seat, maybe a green up front. And uh, in doing so, what they've just done is uh, they've um, required at the hospital the use of additional resources. Because in addition to managing that critically injured patient, the hospital is now going to have to devote resources to care for that yellow or that green. And those resources may be necessary to treat the remaining reds that are coming in. So when you're transporting, you're only transporting one patient at a time. Uh, you know, from a logistic standpoint, the staging supervisor and the transportation supervisor are going to be uh, staging the trucks as they come in, staging the equipment as it's unloaded out of different ambulances, and the transportation supervisor is going to make sure that they don't just move the disaster from point A to point B, uh, the hospital. Uh, I know that hospitals pride themselves in caring for, um, you know, most every single victim in a or patient in a uh, disaster, uh, but we don't want to overwhelm the local emergency department uh, with too many patients, uh, because that'll be detrimental for those waiting for care. So, 
you have to make decisions as a transport officer which patients are going where. Uh, the receiving facilities are contacted early to determine what their capabilities are and let them know what sort of patient count they're going to get. Uh, the transportation officer, not individual EMTs, should communicate. So as far as who's communicating with the comm center, that's the incident commander. Who's communicating with the uh, you know, responding services, that's the staging uh, manager. Who's communicating with the emergency departments, that's the transportation officer. Uh, again, generally too many patients to allow a good radio report, so only basic information is given. When, you're, when the transportation officer is calling in the radio report, not the EMT in the back caring for the patient, but the transportation officer, otherwise you've got multiple EMTs on the radio trying to give reports, and that just, you know, that just uh, jams up the frequency. So the transport officer will give just some basic information, male, female, type of injury, uh, uh, seriousness, and uh, any care that may have been done. Um, the psychological aspects of, of mass casualty incidents we have to be able to address as well because many of these patients we know. Um, there are two issues here dealing with psychological aspects, a, aspects of a mass casualty incident. You've got the patient themselves, uh, so you know, demonstrating a caring and honest demeanor. Uh, can assure the patient and gain trust uh, with the patient, uh, but you're not there to psychoanalyze a person's distress or what about it bothers them most, uh, you know, that sort of thing. Um, psychological first aid may be necessary on the scene of a mass casualty incident for those survivors waiting to be transported, as well as the EMS providers. So with that, we uh, wrap up our discussion on hazmat, multiple casualty incidents, and the incident command system. Questions? Uh, you know how to get a hold of me. Thanks, and I'll uh, talk to you soon.